Hi, I'm Brandon from Achievable. Before we get started, just a quick plug for our learning program. Achievable offers courses on all major FINRA and NASAA exams, including the SIE, Series 6, 7, 63, 65, and 66 exams. This is a great learning program if you're looking for easy to understand, fun, and engaging material that uses technology to help you pass. I wrote the course content exclusively for Achievable, which includes tons of real world examples, videos just like this one on dozens of key topics, a built-in study planner, hundreds of chapter review questions, and unlimited practice exams. In short, if you love these videos, then you will love what we have on Achievable. Our courses are competitively priced, and you can try them out for free to see if our style is the right fit for you. Follow the links below in the description to get started. Shareholders maintain the right to vote on a number of important issues, which include stock splits, executive compensation, and major changes to the issuer's business. But one of the most important aspects of voting rights relates to voting for the board of directors. Your typical board will have somewhere between 8 and 12 members, all tasked with one goal, which is ensuring the overall success of the business or organization that they're running. They drive the big business decisions, and they also manage, which includes hiring and firing the executive team, including the CEO. They're basically the bosses of the bosses, and some go as far to say that they're the soul of the organization. Stockholders are the owners of the company, but actually don't have any direct management capabilities. Their power is representative through their voting for the board of directors. And it's very similar to how our political system is set up here in the United States. We, the citizens, don't actually come up with the laws that are then passed and enforced. It's our politicians that we vote in that come up with the laws and then have them enforced from there. And that's just like how stockholders vote in the board of directors to drive the big decisions of the organization and represent their interests. Let's take a look at a real-world proxy to better understand how the voting capabilities of a stockholder works. This is a proxy for DXC technology. I'll give you full transparency and let you know that I am a shareholder in this company. It's a small position. It's around four shares of stock. And we'll actually see that. You can see it on the screen here right now, actually. Uh, but that's not a recommendation or a solicitation. I'll be completely honest with you. I don't really know much about this company. I don't remember buying the shares. But I recently got in my email a notice of a proxy. And DXC looks like they have their annual meeting right around uh, July of every year. This proxy was given to all the holders as of May 27th, 2022, as you can see there, um, which means that you had to be a settled owner on the transfer agent's books to be eligible to vote in this specific proxy. As you've learned in the achievable materials, the word proxy means substitute. And these are substitute voting materials for people who cannot show up to the annual in-person meeting. And you know what's interesting? I, I had to look up where DXC was having their annual meeting, where the physical meeting was occurring, but they're actually doing just a virtual meeting this year. There, there is no physical meeting. And uh, I wonder if that's because of COVID or if that's just a change with, uh, with how uh, technologically uh, savvy everyone is and everyone can join through their phones these days. Uh, I, I don't know, but we still call it a proxy, even though uh, there's not a physical annual meeting happening anywhere. In this annual meeting, DXC will go through a number of different things, which will include their challenges and their successes that they've seen over the last year. Uh, probably some financials in there in terms of how they've been doing. Not just probably, they will have some financials and they'll show what their profitability is. They'll probably go over some outlook for the future, uh, maybe even provide some guidance in terms of how successful they think they'll be financially over the next year or so. A number of different things they'll, they'll cover. But one of the primary items, and in fact, the first thing that I see when I log in and look at the meeting agenda are the things that they need shareholders to vote on. And this is not unique to DXC. Pretty much in any proxy materials that you come across as a shareholder will probably have the majority of the votes centered around board of directors. Now, DXC has 10 board of director seats, and it looks like they do this vote every single year. To be able to hold on to a seat 
or to be voted into the seat, all that has to happen is you have to have more for votes than against votes. And that's it. Just more for than against. Now, this is what we call a non-contested board of directors or an uncontested board of directors uh, vote. Uh, a contested vote would be something like, here's one seat, there's two people going for it. You know, whoever gets the most votes wins that seat. But that's not how it is here. We have 10 people up for vote for 10 chairs. All that has to happen is they have to get more for votes than against votes. Shares available says I have four, which means I have four votes. That's actually an important test point. You get one vote for every share that you own, which you can probably put two and two together. The more shares in the company that you own, the bigger the vote you have. And that should make sense, right? The, the more you own of the company, the bigger your say should be. So every time I make a vote uh, for something, I'm making a four share vote. Now, before we go further into the board of directors stuff, let's just take a quick look at this. There are some other things here at the bottom that shareholders are voting on. Uh, if you look at number two there, ratification of the appointment of uh, this company as an independent registered public accounting firm. Yeah, if you're going to change your accountant or it looks like you're going to ratify the appointment of this new uh, accounting firm, you have to get shareholder approval for something like that. might seem inconsequential to some of you, but that's something that a lot of companies have their shareholders vote on. And at the very bottom, approval by advisory vote of our named executive officer compensation. I, I don't think this is a really important test point, but in case you're wondering, an advisory vote is one where the shareholders vote on something, but it's not the final say. It, it's kind of like the company asking for their shareholders to give them some input, but they're basically saying here, it doesn't, you know, we're going to do what we want, but we want to see what you guys would want us to do. It sounds like the board is going to do whatever they want to do with executive officer compensation or whoever's in control of that. There's a link also on this page that brings us here, which is, uh, I think, the actual proxy statement. Look at that. Notice of 2022 annual meeting of stockholders and proxy statement. Uh, we can take a quick look at this just to see, you know, what people typically get with something like, like this uh, statement here. You get a, you know, nice welcoming page. Hey, uh, you can attend our virtual meeting. Here's a link. A little bit about the company, etc. We don't need to go too much over that. Your vote is important. Voting is always important, right? If you scroll down a bit, <clears throat> actually get to this page and we'll talk about the purpose of the meeting. Purpose of the meeting is to elect the 10 director nominees listed in the proxy statement. We'll look at a few of them. Talked about the accounting firm, bullet num point number two. Talk about the executive officer compensation, point number three. Number four is just to, hey, to transact any other business uh, that may properly come before the meeting and any postponements or adjournments thereof. Just another way of saying other meeting type stuff we'll talk about. Um, cool. So if we go down a little bit further, I'll just show you. Um, on the original page, it was just a name. Right. Uh, do I want to vote for Amy Alving or do I want to vote for David Herzog? In a proxy statement, you also get a pretty good idea of who that person is, how uh, we can say how old they are, how long they've been a director. Looks like most of these directors have been on for at least a year, if not longer. And uh, and what's their principal occupation? And as you can see, a lot of the board members here have uh, some pretty uh, some big, pretty big credentials. Some of them even serve on the board of other publicly traded companies. Interesting. We can even go down a little bit further and get more information um, on every one of our board of director nominees and get a little bit of their story, their qualifications, etc. So as a stockholder, you can get in here, maybe learn a little bit more about the people you might be voting for or maybe even against and go from there. Let's go back here real quick and just follow up on our board of director voting conversation. As you've learned in your achievable materials, uh, there are two different types of voting structures. There's a statutory voting structure and a cumulative voting structure. DXC maintains a statutory voting structure. Statutory means that I get up to four votes times each director position that's open. And I can only allocate those votes to each individual board of director seat. So what does that actually mean? Let's say that I'm looking at these seven board members here and I really only like Amy Alving. I don't really care about anyone else. I don't really know about anyone else. Well, with the statutory voting structure, I could only apply four votes towards Amy and that is it. If I abstained on all the others, I couldn't take the votes from other board members and apply it to Amy, even if I really liked Amy. 
So again, with statutory, I can only apply a maximum of four votes towards Amy Alving. With cumulative, I can get really flexible with how I apply my votes. I can essentially take all the votes I have and apply it to one person going for one board seat if I really wanted to. So back to our example, let's say that we have these seven board members going up for seven seats. Again, I really like Amy Alving, I don't know anyone else. If I wanted to take my votes from the other potential board members and then apply them all to Amy, I certainly could. And again, if there are seven board seats we're looking at here and I have four shares, that means I have 28 potential votes that I could put all on Amy if I wanted to. And that's the benefit of cumulative. You can dogpile basically your votes onto one party and go from there. Let's take a quick look at an achievable question on this same topic to understand how they might ask this question on the real test. Your customer owns 200 shares of Kendall Co. stock, which is under a statutory voting system. With eight open board seats, what is the maximum number of votes your customer may apply towards one board seat? The first thing we need to remember is we get one vote for every share of our stock that is owned, which we have 200 shares here. The question is specifically asking about how many votes can be applied towards one board seat. Remember with statutory, we can only apply the number of votes we have based upon the number of shares that we have on a board seat by board seat basis. Unlike cumulative, we can't borrow votes from other seats and apply them to one board seat. So really for this question here, you know, how many votes can we apply to one board seat and under a statutory voting system with 200 shares? The answer is 200 votes. That's it. Now, if this was cumulative, then we could apply our votes in a little bit of a different manner. Remember, cumulative means that we can take our votes and we can get flexible with them. And essentially, if this was a question on that voting structure, we could take our 200 votes, multiply in times of eight board seats, which would get us to 1600 votes and apply them all towards one board seat. And that's why you might remember reading about how cumulative voting structures are actually beneficial to the small shareholder. If a couple of small shareholders get together and apply all their votes onto one potential board member for one seat, they might actually win. So let's actually summarize the big picture here in terms of how many votes you get for one board seat. If it's statutory, the number of votes you get per board seat really just equals however many shares that you own. But if it's cumulative, then you have the number of shares you own times the number of open board seats, and you can apply them all into that one board seat and get really flexible with your voting.